Man, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of EOS. It's 1090 J, man. I'm rocking with y'all. Y'all rocking with me. And for this video, we're going to be speaking on a man that committed a few murders so brutal, it's straight out of a horror movie. Saturday, October 2nd, 2021. Polk County Sheriff's responded to 1681 Kona Lane regarding a call for an armed disturbance. And what they'd find would truly be disturbing. Arriving at the home, law enforcement found themselves within the scene of a horror movie as a man laid on the front porch covered in blood. He was clearly no longer alive and looked as if he'd crawled through a slaughterhouse as his wounds couldn't be seen at first glance from the amount of bodily fluids pooled around him. With weapons now drawn, the intensity of the situation set in as deputies made their way into the home ready to confront a killer. Entering a downstairs bedroom, a man laid unresponsive but breathing as deputies observed the brain matter leaking from his head which looked to have been smashed repeatedly. Calls were made for EMS as they proceeded to clear the home finding a third man in an upstairs bedroom. He was laying in bed, still underneath the comforter, with his head beaten inside of itself. Two men were pronounced dead at the scene. The third, whose brain had possibly been left at the scene, was airlifted to a nearby hospital in critical condition, where he later died. Homicide investigators would learn the incident location was a rental slash vacation home and being used as a rental property for employees of an electric company based out of Pennsylvania. J&B Electric had assigned six employees to the home, with the list of names being passed to law enforcement. Witness number one, Albert Reed. He'd been staying at the home with his co-workers for the past several weeks. He stated to investigators the day before the murders, a fight broke out between two of the other men, one of which was named Sean, who beat the shit out of his supervisor over an unknown disagreement at the job site. Sean then left the job site not even returning to the home, leaving the rest of the crew to believe he left town and went back home to Pennsylvania. When asked about the day of the murders, Albert said he was asleep with his girlfriend at the home. That's when he heard a loud noise and screaming. Walking out of his bedroom, he saw Sean holding a baseball bat in one hand and a knife in the other as he kept stabbing a co-worker whose screams pierced the walls of the home. A scream for help redirected Sean's attention who stopped stabbing the man and was now staring at Albert as he rushed towards him while Albert raced down the stairs and out of the front door before tripping on the driveway. A dull pain came as Sean struck Albert in the back with the baseball bat before running back inside of the house. Leaving his girlfriend upstairs, alone in the room, and his co-worker bleeding out in the hallway, Albert ran for his life down the street as far as he could get from the home. Witness number two, Judd Botnick. He told investigators he heard about the fight at the work site between Sean and another man named Kevin. He wasn't there to witness it, but he was home to know Sean never came back. The day of the murders, Judd was in his upstairs bedroom with his eight-year-old daughter when he heard banging and yelling. He grabbed his daughter immediately, opening the bedroom door in an attempt to get her out of the house when he saw blood everywhere, splattered throughout the second floor. He didn't see anyone, so he rushed downstairs to the garage with his daughter before driving off, and that's when he saw Albert and Albert's girlfriend, Christina, further down the street. Witness number three, Christina Del Cane. Christina had arrived two days prior to the murders, flying down from Pennsylvania to spend time with her boyfriend, Albert. The day of the murders, she awoke, finding herself alone in the bedroom as she heard noise and arguing. She opened the bedroom door, seeing a man armed with a knife covered in blood. She shut the door immediately, locking it, and waited. What may have been less than a minute, but felt like an eternity later, she opened the bedroom door once more and made her way down the stairs when she saw the man in the kitchen, washing the blood from his hands. She turned, running back upstairs, yet again locking herself in the room, and she found herself waiting listening to the sounds of the home for signs if the bloody man was still inside. But all she heard was silence. She took the opportunity to get the fuck out, rushing downstairs and out the front door looking for a boyfriend. She was able to identify Sean to investigators by photo lineup. 
A two hour manhunt in Polk County would come to an end when Sean, who was still covered in blood, ran up to a home on a quiet street telling people he was raped. He was then transported to a nearby hospital where deputies placed him under arrest as homicide investigators made their way over to interview him. Sean stated on Friday, October 1st, he got into a verbal argument with his supervisor, Kevin, who he then batted with his fists. He left the job site immediately after, traveling roughly three hours away to Georgia where he bought a crossbow. It was within those three hours of driving, Sean made a plan to kill his co-workers and was intent on using the bow to do it. Making his way back through Florida, he drove to the Tampa International Airport where he parked his work vehicle and rented a car from the airport. As his thoughts raced, he changed his mind on how he'd approach the attack, so he drove to a nearby Target to buy a different tool for the job. It was 9 in the morning when he arrived back at the house, a brand new baseball bat in one hand and a dirty knife in the other. He made his way through the back door, adjusting a home security camera that was inside and aimed at the back door. That's when he entered Kevin's bedroom. His supervisor laid asleep, and his family could only hope he never woke up as Sean bashed his head in with the bat, describing to investigators he only stopped when he saw his brain. He made his way upstairs into another room, and this man hadn't heard a thing. All Sean had to do was be quick and quiet, and he picked them off one by one. He started swinging to the man's head until his skull gave in. Making his way into the third room, he attempted to strike the man with the bat but missed, so he put his knife to use, repeatedly stabbing the man as he screamed, running before collapsing on the front porch. Investigators found probable cause to charge Sean with three counts of first degree premeditated murder and aggravated battery for striking Albert in the back with the baseball bat as Albert ran away. Part of Sean's confession was claiming he'd been sexually attacked and raped by the men that he'd killed. Not that anyone believed him, but as required, he was given a sexual battery test which showed no signs that he'd been raped. At the time of his arrest, Sean was on pretrial release following an arrest in Pennsylvania on charges of strangulation, endangering the welfare of a child, terroristic threats, two counts of recklessly endangering another person, assault, possession of marijuana, possession of paraphernalia, and harassment. Those charges matter little to none now, as Sean faces the possibility of death under Florida law. Now I wanted to do this video when I first got the news, but I kept checking the court site for the paperwork, it wasn't there, I finally got the affidavit, and I'm not disappointed. As disgusting as this case is, this is literally the script to a horror movie. Guy goes nuts, pops off on his boss, makes a plan to murder everybody inside of the house. And what's even more disturbing about this, right? He was only able to kill three people. The third room that he walked into, whether the man was already awake or he woke up as he tried to hit him with the bat and he fought back, that noise was able to alert everyone else to get out. Everyone else being Albert and Albert's girlfriend and the other man who was in a room with his eight-year-old daughter. And God only knows what would have happened had he killed that other man quietly and got into the room with the man and his daughter. Now this sick fuck is about to find out how it is being locked up down in Florida. I don't know how it is in Pennsylvania being a white guy, but he's in the Polk County Jail right now. He's going to find out it's a little different down here. And if he ends up going to prison and avoids death and he's on general population, regular compounds, he's going to really find out how it is. All that, you know, I'm crazy shit. If he tries to go that route, no one gives a fuck. All that white supremacy shit, I promise nobody gives a fuck in Florida State Prison. It's going to be a wake up call. You killed people that were pretty much harmless sleeping. You know what I mean? You found easy victims, and the one guy that was alive was able to fight back. You still stabbed him up and ended up killing him. But the other people were able to get away. And I say that to say this. Yeah, you've killed people, but inside of the Florida Department of Corrections, they're going to actually find out and test if you're a real killer. They want to get into it with people that they view as competition. Oh, you think you like that? I'm like that. Now let's see who's worse. 
But this isn't gonna come anytime soon. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of court dates and everything that needs to be gone through. I mean, this man tried to claim that he was raped. I think that's one of the worst parts about this case is not only did he murder these three people in brutal fashion, but somebody actually had to inspect this man's asshole for signs that somebody went up in there. And they said nobody did, it was bullshit. It's one of the strangest reasons to give for killing somebody. I mean, if you're gonna be remembered for something, at least tell them like, oh, I just didn't like them. Some gangster shit, like, oh, I had a bad day, so I decided to kill them. You don't tell them that you got blown out. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a weird way to fucking end things, but you know, it's a weird guy at the same time. But I wouldn't be surprised if they end up making, you know, five, 10 years from now, some home invasion type of fucking movie. I forget what movie it was, but um, there was a movie where there was a couple inside of a hotel and these people with masks show up and it was a home invasion killer type scenario. It reminded me of this case so fucking much, but this guy is obviously as disturbed as this case is disturbing. But hey, it's 1090 Jake. I'm rocking with y'all y'all rocking with me. Till next time.